Hi everyone, it's Sirsha. I know I've been absent for a couple weeks and that is because I've been really focusing on this book and didn't have the brain space to do videos on anything else. The book I want to talk about today is The Body Keeps the Score. This is by Bessel van der Kolk and it was published in 2014. Now, you're going to have to bear with me because there are about 100,000 things that I'm going to pull out of here. This will be a long video. Uh, I'm just going to read the back for you and let you know a trigger warning because this book deals with trauma. That is what it's all about. So if you have trauma of any kind, um, sexual abuse, child abuse, um, any kind of violence, trauma, anything, you might want to sit this one out if you think it'll be difficult for you. And with that said, uh, I think this book should be sort of like required reading in a lot of spheres because there are concepts in here that had I had access to them 10, 12 years ago, I think my life would have gone a bit differently. This, this to me is a life-changing text and that is because I now feel like I have the tools to understand why why I am the way I am, okay? And this, this is gonna get a little scientific, but he writes it in such a way that I think this is very, very, um, not easy, I can't think of the right word, but it's, it's extremely readable. And this is somebody who is not a science person and I understood everything that he was saying. So please don't be scared of it. Uh, without all the notes in the back, it's about 360 pages. It's, it's doable. Pick it up, read it, share it, and feel empowered to understand your own brain, your mind, your body, how these things work together and how you've been impacted from your personal trauma. Because, turns out, it's real, and it can be scientifically proven in brain scans. So many things, like PTSD, it, they, you can see the way that they work actually visible in your brain. And that just takes such a weight off my chest, because I've been told for so long and thought for so long that that I need to just you know, look at things differently, or um, that I didn't have it so bad, so why why would I be so messed up? Well, it's actually observable stuff. Um, so I hope that this book can do for you what it did for me if you have similar issues. Okay. This is going to be a lot of me trying to say what is very difficult to put into words, so I'm glad, I'm glad he put this into words for me. I'm, re I'm gonna read the back. Trauma is a fact of life. Veterans and their families deal with the painful aftermath of combat. One in five Americans has been molested. One in four grew up with alcoholics. One in three couples have engaged in physical violence. Dr. Bessel van der Kolk, one of the world's, most, world's foremost experts on trauma, has spent over three decades working with survivors. In The Body Keeps the Score, he uses recent scientific advances to show how trauma literally reshapes both body and brain, compromising sufferers' capacities for pleasure, engagement, self-control, and trust. He explores innovative treatments from neurofeedback and meditation to sports, drama, and yoga that offer new paths to recovery by activating the brain's natural neuroplasticity. Based on Dr. Van der Kolk's own research and that of other leading specialists, The Body Keeps the Score exposes the tremendous power of our relationships both to hurt and to heal, and offers new hope for reclaiming lives. Okay. So I'll try not to go into all of my own personal trauma, but I will say that I've always felt like it's not bad enough, you know, not bad enough. So even in therapy for so many years, I've felt like I can't talk about it. Um, like I haven't earned the right to talk about it, which is so wrong, 
but I know why why I've felt that way because we just aren't educated as much as we should be on this topic. So my therapist said recently, you can drown in an ocean or an inch of water. Whatever you, whatever trauma you might have experienced, however big or small you think it is or other people tell you it is, which by the way, it's not their business and they don't know, it can absolutely affect you emotionally, physiologically, everything. Um, so we'll just dive into this, but I want you to, I want you to know that if you feel like you don't have the right to talk about your trauma or investigate it, uh, you absolutely do, no matter what it is. So the first part in this book is all about how trauma works, how it affects the brain and the body, um, you know, during your development and then later in your life, how it still is there, it doesn't go away. And then... In the last like third of the book, it's all about healing. Um, okay, let us dive in. This is going to be a lot. I hope this is useful to someone. Okay. While we all want to move beyond trauma, the part of our brain that is devoted to ensuring our survival deep below our rational brain is not very good at denial. Long after a traumatic experience is over, it may be reactivated at the slightest hint of danger and mobilize disturbed brain circuits and secrete massive amounts of stress hormones. This precipitates unpleasant emotions, intense physical sensations, and impulsive and aggressive actions. These post-traumatic reactions feel incomprehensible and overwhelming. Feeling out of control, survivors of trauma often begin to fear that they are damaged to the core and beyond redemption. We now know that trauma can compromises the brain area that communicates the physical embodied feeling of being alive. These changes explain why traumatized individuals become hypervigilant to threat at the expense of spontaneously engaging in their day-to-day -day lives. They also help us understand why traumatized people so often keep repeating the same problems and have such trouble learning from experience. We now know that their behaviors are not the result of moral failings or signs of lack of willpower or bad character. They are caused by actual changes in the brain. If there's one thing I want you to remember, it's that actual changes in the brain. It is not that you are a bad person, um, that you keep making the same mistakes, or that you you push people away in relationships, or you're always on guard. It's it's it is your brain, the way that things were wired from infancy sometimes because of your treatment. Not now. I'm going to get into nature versus nurture, but this book has fully pushed me into the camp of nurture. That even if you have certain genetic, um, what's the right word? You have a, I can't remember. You have certain genetic things that might push you in one direction. If you are given the proper care as an infant and a child, you won't go that way. You will, um, you will be properly set up. For life and you will feel secure. So it is to me all about nurture. Okay, this is gonna be a five-hour video. Um, so yeah, it's hard to move on because the brain is it's literally secreting these stress hormones. So that's something that I, I just wish that somebody could have explained to me, you know, when I started therapy at like 16. And I've always been so hard on myself and, and hated myself. And if somebody had just given me this knowledge that, that it, this is actually observable stuff in the brain um, and I'm not making it up, I, I think I would have felt a lot better about myself. But I'm doing the work now. Many traumatized people seem to seek out experiences that would repel most of us, and patients often complain about a vague sense of emptiness and boredom when they are not angry, under duress, or involved in some dangerous activity. So, I, I totally understand and relate to this being unbearably bored when not in chaos. It makes sense, and I think I might have other passages in here that explain that. So we'll just keep moving. Hmm. 
we okay we concluded that Beecher's speculation that strong emotions can block pain was the result of the release of morphine like substances manufactured in the brain this suggested that for many traumatized people re-exposure to stress might provide a similar relief from anxiety okay so being re-exposed to stress again is a, temp a temporary relief because when you are feeling these very, very, very strong emotions, it's like you can't feel what's happening in your body. And there's going to be a lot about dissociation in here as well. My patients were always blowing up in response to small provocations and felt devastated by the slightest rejection. I became fascinated by the possible role of serotonin in PTSD. Other researchers had shown that dominant male monkeys had much higher levels of brain serotonin than lower ranking animals, but that their serotonin levels dropped when they were prevented from maintaining eye contact with the monkeys they had once lorded over. A lot of interesting um, experiments that he talks about in here. So low serotonin makes you react poorly to small stimuli. I've noticed that I've always been very, very quick to blow up to feel extremely upset by small things and I'm affected by um, noises and certain behaviors and just external stimuli in the environment. I feel, I feel very overstimulated very easily and I also always feel like I'm in fight or flight mode and now I get why. Um, which, you know, I cried a lot reading this book because it just made me hurt for my myself as a child um, and as a teenager and a young adult and, and not knowing why I felt the way I did um, or having suspicions but not truly understanding it and now I feel like I do and it's just it's a lot at once so this has been a pretty wild couple of weeks When something reminds traumatized people of the past, their right brain reacts as if the traumatic event were happening in the present, but because their left brain is not working very well, they may not be aware that they are re-experiencing and reenacting the past. They are just furious, terrified, enraged, ashamed, or frozen. After the emotional storm passes, they may look for something or somebody to blame for it. They behaved the way they did because you were ten minutes late, or because you burned the potatoes, or because you never listened to me. Of course, most of us have done this from time to time, but when we cool down, we hopefully can admit our mistake. Trauma interferes with this kind of awareness, and over time, our research demonstrated why. Um, yeah, so there's reasons why we behave this way. You know, I just felt like, oh, I'm not crazy. Because having been called crazy many times for things like needing things to be a specific way and, and needing people to be very straightforward with me, and if they say they're going to be somewhere at a certain time to be there because otherwise, oh my god, the world's ending and I've been abandoned and lied to and oh, I wonder why I feel that way. Um, yeah. Again, not gonna get into specifics, but it all makes sense now. Effects of being constantly on edge. Okay, let's see. Um, he's talking about adrenaline, increased adrenaline is responsible for a dramatic rise in heart rate and blood pressure. As soon as the threat is over, the hormones dissipate and the body returns to normal. The stress hormones of traumatized people, in contrast, take much longer to return to baseline and spike quickly and disproportionately in response to mildly stressful stimuli. The insidious effects of constantly elevated stress hormones include memory and attention problems, irritability, and sleep disorders. They also contribute to many long-term health issues, depending on which body system is most vulnerable in a particular individual. It is very upsetting to realize how many health issues can be caused and exacerbated by trauma because your body stores it. I mean, that's the point of this book. Your body stores all the memory of trauma, even if sometimes you don't actually remember what happened. <clears throat> and because a lot of things have to do with the first couple years of your life. And most people can't remember that. Um, 
Some people simply go into denial, which is another response to threat. Their bodies register the threat, but their conscious minds go on as if nothing has happened. However, even though the mind may learn to ignore the messages from the emotional brain, the alarm signals don't stop. The emotional brain keeps working and stress hormones keep sending signals to the muscles to tense for action or immobilize in collapse. The physical effects on the organs go on unabated until they demand notice when they are expressed as illness. Medications, drugs, and alcohol can also temporarily dull or obliterate unbearable sensations and feelings, but the body continues to keep the score. Every time he said the body keeps the score, it was very exciting. <sighs> okay. So yeah, we, we have observable effects of um, being constantly on edge. It is so, so bad for us. After trauma, the world is experienced with a different nervous system. The survivor's energy now becomes focused on suppressing inner chaos at the expense of spontaneous involvement in their life. These attempts to maintain control over unbearable physiological reactions can result in a whole range of physical symptoms, including fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and other autoimmune diseases. This ex explains why it is critical for trauma treatment to engage the entire organism, body, mind, and brain. So I just, I have always felt like people who have trauma are working so much harder every day than, than people who are untraumatized. Of course, it's exhausting. We have to, we have to work so hard just to get to the baseline of a person who is not traumatized. Um, if we can get there at all, it's, it's emotionally and physically exhausting. Um, and this is not something that you can see on the surface, you know, it's completely invisible to most people that that traumatized people are fighting so hard every second of every day to feel safe, to feel secure, and, um, and to react in a way that is seen as, um, you know, socially normal to, you know, to not blow up at little things, because that, uh, that kind of makes it obvious to the rest of the world that there's something wrong with us, that we're different somehow, and then that kind of puts us in a place of danger. And yeah, I can't speak for every traumatized person, obviously. Everyone's experience is different, but it is remarkable how much we have in common, um, that he goes into in this book. And please don't come for me as if like I'm supposed to be an expert on anything. I All I've done is, is read this book. So I am no expert. Uh, when a circuit fires repeatedly, it can become a default setting, a response most likely to occur. If you feel safe and loved, your brain becomes specialized in exploration, play, and cooperation. If you are frightened and unwanted, it specializes in managing feelings of fear and abandonment. I have always been preoccupied with fear and abandonment. So, yeah, of course life is harder for neglected kids, not just when they're kids, but when they grow up, they have so much farther to go to get to this place of being able to explore and play and have normal friendships when they are scared, scared of other people and scared of people abandoning them. You, we just, we have to be so, so much more patient than we are. And don't get me started on the hellscape that is school and how we just punish children um, for having bad behaviors when obviously those behaviors come from somewhere and they start at home. You know, a kid's not just throwing a tantrum to throw a tantrum. It's usually because there's something bad going on at home. And then if you tell the parents about what they've done at school, more bad things will happen at home, and it's a cycle. You know, we need schools to be a safe place, because for a lot of kids, it's the only safe place that they have. So if it's not safe, where do they have to go?
Um, anyway. Taken together, the reptilian brain and limbic system make up what I'll call the emotional brain throughout this book. The emotional brain is at the heart of the central nervous system, and its key task is to look out for your welfare. If it detects danger or a special opportunity, such as a promising partner, it alerts you by releasing a squirt of hormones. The resulting visceral sensations, ranging from mild queasiness to the grip of panic in your chest, will interfere with whatever your mind is currently focused on and get you moving, physically and mentally, in a different direction. Even at their, at their most subtle, these sensations have a huge influence on the small and large decisions we make throughout our lives. What we choose to eat, where we like to sleep and with whom, what music we prefer, whether we like to garden or sing in a choir, and whom we bef befriend and whom we detest. So, I liked that passage because here we have it. There's actual observable stuff going on. You know, this is hormones being put out and when people say, like, you know, their heart is broken, or they feel like they've been gut-punched, like, these, these are actual physical sensations that come from the emotions that we're talking about. There's a reason we say all of these things. And it's not, we're not making it up. It, this, I, maybe that's intuitive, but it's just fascinating to me. Well, we're still, like, at the beginning. Oh, dear. Okay, so we get to dissociation, and that's where I start tabbing a lot of things, because um, that is one of the main things that I've, my brain has done to, to help me cope with trauma, is, is I, I dissociate. And I've been doing that for as long as I can remember. Dissociation and the is the es Ugh. dissociation is the essence of trauma. The overwhelming experience is split off and fragmented so that the emotions, sounds, images, thoughts, and physical sensations related to the trauma take on a life of their own. The sensory fragments of memory intrude into the present where they are literally relived. As long as the trauma is not resolved, the stress hormones that the body secretes to protect itself keep circulating, and the defensive movements and emotions, emotional responses keep getting replayed. Uh, many people may not be aware of the connection between their crazy feelings and reactions and the traumatic events that are being replayed. They have no idea why they respond to some minor irritation, as if they were about to be annihilated. Um, and if these elements of trauma are replayed again and again, the stress hormones engrave those memories even more deeply into the mind, Day-to-day -day events become less compelling. Not being able to, to deeply take in what is going on around them makes it impossible to feel fully alive. It becomes harder to feel the joys and aggravations of ordinary life, harder to concentrate on the tasks at hand. Not being fully alive in the present keeps them more firmly imprisoned in the past. Um, this is something that I experienced, just not being present. It is very difficult to feel present or interested in pretty much anything. Um, these reactions are irrational and largely outside people's control. Intense and barely controllable ur urges and emotions make people feel crazy and makes them feel they don't belong to the human race. Feeling numb during birthday parties for your kids or in response to the death of loved ones makes people feel like monsters. As a result, shame becomes the dominant emotion and hiding the truth, the central preoccupation. So yeah, feeling numb is just... The norm. Uh, he talks about having an efficient smoke detector. If you have a smoke detector that's always going off, right, do you believe it? Um, so when your brain is in fight or flight, it's always going off. It's important to have an efficient smoke detector. You don't want to get caught unawares by a raging fire, but if you go into a frenzy every time you smell smoke, it becomes intensely disruptive. Yes, you need to detect whether somebody is getting upset with you, but if your amygdala goes into overdrive, you may become chronically scared that people hate you or may feel like they're out to get you. That's me to a T. Everybody hates me. Everybody's out to get me. Um, felt very validating to read that. He talks about this couple that experiences a traumatic event together, um, which is a massive pileup of cars. And one of them reacts by dissociating and the other one doesn't. 
in this one who dissociated, he learns that um, that her mother was very abusive to her, and when when she was yelling at her, the girl discovered that she could blank out her mind while it was happening. So 35 years later, when she was trapped in her demolished car, her brain automatically went into the same survival mode. She made herself disappear. So it's something you learn in childhood. And if you're screamed at a lot, um, it's a common reaction to kind of get small and go away. And um, so, yeah, I find myself doing that if I even perceive a little bit that somebody is raising their voice at me. And if anything scary is happening at all, then I just go away. Uh, While well, reliving trauma is dramatic, frightening, and potentially self-destructive, over time a lack of presence can be even more damaging. This is a particular problem with traumatized children. The acting out kids tend to get attention, the blanked out ones don't. Um, don't bother anybody and are left to lose their future bit by bit. So kids are ignored if they aren't making a big deal out of things. And this is a cycle that just goes on and on and God, things need to change. Because we've all seen those kids like, you know, in school and then I was a substitute teacher and I've seen a lot of things. And you see the ones that are acting terribly and constantly getting sent to the office, all this stuff, and then the ones who are just totally blanked out and who's getting more attention. Do they both have maybe similar trauma going on at home? Maybe. Can't read my notes. The challenge of trauma treatment is not only dealing with it Dealing with the past, but even more enhancing the quality of day-to-day -day experience. One reason that traumatic memories become dominant in PTSD is that it's so difficult to feel truly alive right now. When you can't be fully here, you go to the places where you did feel alive, even if those places are filled with horror and misery. So many things that I have thought about myself. Why am I doing this? Why am I thinking this way? Why am I like this? He's just written down in here, like fact. and. I can't tell you how much that has helped. Just such a feeling of validation to know that I'm not, I'm not the only one who has these thoughts and who behaves this way. If an organism is stuck in survival mode, its energies are focused on fighting off unseen enemies, which leaves no room for nurture, care, and love. For us humans, it means that as long as the mind is defending itself against invisible assaults, our closest bonds are threatened along with our ability to imagine, plan, play, learn, and pay attention to other people's needs. Um, and then he talks about what I was saying before. Uh, we experience our most devastating emotions as gut-wrenching feelings and heartbreak. As long as we register emotions primarily in our heads, we can remain pretty much in control. But feeling as if our chest is caving in or we've been punched in the gut is unbearable. We'll do anything to make these awful visceral sensations go away, whether it is clinging desperately to another human being, rendering ourselves insensible with drugs or alcohol, or taking a knife to the skin to replace overwhelming emotions with definable sensations. How many mental health problems from drug addiction to self-injurious behavior start as attempts to cope with the unbearable physical pain of our emotions? Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. Safe connections are fundamental to meaningful and satisfying lives. Numerous studies of disaster response around the globe have shown that social support is the most powerful protection against becoming overwhelmed by stress and trauma. We need each other, and that can be very, very hard to come to terms with when you have been traumatized by other human beings. How can you possibly trust people again? I have this like piece of fur on my face that I cannot get off and so I just keep trying to get it. I'm not picking my nose, but whatever. We all do that anyway. Fight or flight. 
energy. Um, for many people, panic and rage are preferable to the opposite, shutting down and becoming dead to the world. Activating fight or flight at least makes them feel energized. That is why so many abused and traumatized people feel fully alive in the face of actual danger, while they go numb in, in situations that are more complex but objectively safe, like birthday parties or family dinners. Relatable. Achieving any sort of deep intimacy, a close embrace, sleeping with a mate, and sex requires allowing oneself to experience immobilization without fear. It is especially challenging for traumatized people to discern when they are actually safe and to be able to activate their defenses when they are in danger. This requires having experiences that can restore the sense of physical safety. So that, that phrase, immobilization without fear, is so important because imagine how hard that is for people who have been held down or just trapped in an environment where they are treated badly um, to be able to then feel immobilized again but in a way that is safe and not dangerous it's, it's very hard to tell the difference at first I thought this was interesting. Severely traumatized people may get more out of simply helping to arrange chairs before a meeting or joining others in tapping out a musical rhythm on the chair seats than they would from sitting in those same chairs and discussing the failures in their life. So, speaking of, like, support groups, movement is so important. And you'll get a big understanding of that if you read this book about how the body... Um, can take us a long way in healing. There's some people that don't even have to talk about what has happened to them. They can, they're able to heal with physical treatments. Okay, here we go. Over the years, our research team has repeatedly found that chronic emotional abuse and neglect can be just as devastating as physical abuse and sexual molestation. So there is no trauma too small. Please remind yourself of that if you just feel like, oh, well, I haven't had it as bad as other people, because chances are that's what your parents told you. Other people have it worse. You know, buck up. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. Like, I'm not treating you like crap. This person's, like, this person beats their kid with a belt. Like, at least I don't do that to you. Your parents probably were gaslighting you like this. Um, so you believe that, that your trauma is just not big enough to even get into. It is. Uh, this was kind of devastating. If no one has ever looked at you with loving eyes or broken out in a smile when she sees you, if no one has rushed to help you but instead, instead said stop crying or I'll give you something to cry about, then you need to discover other ways of taking care of yourself. You are likely to experiment with anything, drugs, alcohol, binge eating, or cutting, that offers some kind of relief. Um, so we, we only know what we've experienced. How could, how could we possibly know anything else, you know? In response to the trauma itself and in coping with the dread that persisted long afterward, these patients had learned to shut down the brain areas that transmit the visceral feelings and emotions that accompany and define terror. Yet in everyday life, those same brain areas are responsible for reg registering the emotion the entire range of emotions and sensations that form the foundation of our self-awareness, our sense of who we are. What we witnessed here was a tragic adaptation. In an effort to shut off terrifying sensations, they also deadened their capacity to feel fully alive. So there's, you know, one of the very uh, devastating things about dissociation, that you are protecting yourself, or your brain is trying to protect you from all these bad things, but you are completely shut off to anything good as well because you can't feel anything. Our sensory world takes shape even before we are born. In the womb, we feel amniotic fluid against our skin. We hear the faint sounds of rushing blood and a digestive tract at work. We pitch and roll with our mother's movements. After birth, physical sensation defines our relationship to ourselves and to our surroundings. We start off being our wetness, hunger, satiation, and sleepiness. 
A cacophony of incomprehensible sounds and images presses in on our pristine nervous system. This just shows to me the importance of all of our senses working together, and when we're traumatized, it doesn't always work that way. Again, they, um, your sense is going to go out of whack. Somatic symptoms, for which no clear physical basis can be found, are ubiquitous in traumatized children and adults. They can include chronic back and neck pain, fibromyalgia, migraines, digestive problems, spastic colon irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, and some forms of asthma. Traumatized children have 50 times the rate of asthma as their non-traumatized peers. Studies have shown that many children and adults with fatal asthma attacks were not aware of having breathing problems before the attacks. <clears throat> so I highlighted that and thought, my neck pain? My chronic neck pain I've had since I was about nine years old that no doctor has ever been able to explain that I've had every single treatment under the sun for and still hurts all the time to the point that it's debilitating. I have been told sometimes, you know, maybe that's where you store your trauma. And I'm like, right here, right here on the right side of my neck? Why? Who knows why? You know, maybe it's not that easy to explain, but it makes a lot of sense to me uh, that that could be what it is because there's no, there is no logical explanation. Um, okay, he's talking about the striking difference between normal, normal kids and survivors of chronic trauma. Um, it's in the activation of the prefront, prefrontal cortex in response to a direct eye gaze. So the PFC normally helps us to assess the person coming toward us and our mirror neurons help to pick up intentions. However, the subjects with PTSD did not activate any part of their frontal lobe which means they could not muster any curiosity about the stranger. They just reacted with intense activation deep inside their emotional brains in the primitive areas known as the periaqueductal gray, which generates startle, hypervigilance, cowering, and other self-protective behaviors. There is no activation of any part of the brain involved in social engagement. In response to being looked at, they simply went into survival mode. We can see it. Your brain becomes trained this way. Um, this is not a choice that you're making. Oh, I'm going to go into survival mode now because somebody's looking me in the eye. No. Your brain is doing it. You're, I mean, literally you can see certain bits of the brain not being lit up in people who have trauma. So he talks about this kid that is always getting in trouble, breaking into neighbors' houses, and he's been caught numerous times. He knew the police and they knew him. With delight in his voice, he told me that when the cops saw him standing in the middle of the living room, they yelled, oh my god, it's Jack again. Somebody recognized him. Somebody knew his name. A little while later, Jack confessed, you know, that is what makes it worthwhile. Kids will go to almost any length to feel seen and connected. Okay, doesn't that make it make so much more sense that we have these kids that we label troublemakers in school? They'll just do absolutely anything to be known, because we need to be known as humans. We're social creatures. And when we're traumatized, that's kind of taken away from us. Children who don't feel safe in infancy have trouble regulating their moods and emotional responses as they grow older. By kindergarten, many disorganized infants are either aggressive or spaced out and disengaged, and they go on to develop a range of psychiatric problems. They also show more physiological stress, as expressed in heart rate, heart rate variability, stress hormone responses, and lowered immune factors. Does this kind of biological dysregulation automatically reset to normal as a child matures or is moved to a safe environment? So far as we know, it does not. So you remain dysregulated forever until you uh, find a way to heal your trauma. How scary is that? You can take a child out of a dangerous situation and put them in a safe one, but that damage is already done. 
If you have no internal sense of security, it is difficult to distinguish between safety and danger. If you feel chronically numbed out, potentially dangerous situations may make you feel alive. If you conclude that you must be a terrible person, because why else would your parents have treated you that way, you start expecting other people to treat you horribly. You probably deserve it, and anyway, there's nothing you can do about it. When disorganized people carry self-perceptions like these, they are set up to be traumatized by subsequent experiences. It's a cycle. You're traumatized as a child, um, it just keeps happening to you, and you wonder why, what is wrong with me, why me? It's all here. <clears throat> okay, so here's another experiment. This person and her colleagues, they had expected that hostile, intrusive behavior on part of the mothers would be the most powerful predictor of mental instability in their adult children, but they discovered otherwise. Emotional withdrawal had the most profound and long-lasting impact. Emotional distance and role reversal, in which mothers expected the kids to look after them, were specifically linked to aggressive behavior against self and others in the young adults. Neglect. Neglect is a massive problem and a cause of trauma in your brain. Um, Okay, here's a bunch of stuff. Um, dissociation, knowing and not knowing. This person was particularly interested in the phenomenon of dissociation, which is manifested in feeling lost, overwhelmed, abandoned, and disconnected from the world, and in seeing oneself as unloved, empty, helpless, trapped, and weighed down. She found a striking and unexpected relationship between maternal disengagement and misattunement during the first two years of life and dissociative symptoms in early adulthood. Lyons Ruth concludes that infants who are not truly seen and known by their mothers are at high risk to grow into adolescents who are unable to know and to see. Infants who live in secure relationships learn to communicate not only their frustrations and distress, but also their emerging selves, their interests, preferences, and goals. Receiving a sympathetic response cushions infants and adults against extreme levels of frightened arousal. But if your caregivers ignore your needs or resent your very existence, you learn to anticipate rejection and withdrawal. You cope as well as you can by blocking out your mother's hostility or neglect and act as if it doesn't matter, but your body is likely to remain in a state of high alert, prepared to ward off blows, deprivation, or abandonment. Dissociation means simultaneously knowing and not knowing. <clears throat> um, somebody wrote, what cannot be communicated to the mother cannot be communicated to the self. If you cannot tolerate what you know or feel what you feel, the only option is denial and dissociation. Maybe the most devastating long-term effect of this shutdown is not feeling real inside, a condition we saw in the kids in the children's clinic and that we see in the children and adults who come to the trauma center. When you don't feel real, nothing matters, which makes it impossible to protect yourself from danger. Or you may resort to extremes in an effort to feel something, even cutting yourself with a razor blade or getting into fistfights with strangers. Um, dissociation is learned early. Later abuse or other traumas did not account for dissociative symptoms in young adults. Abuse and trauma accounted for many other problems, but not for chronic dissociation or aggression against self. The critical underlying issue was that these patients didn't know how to feel safe. Lack of safety within the early caregiving relationship led to an impaired sense of inner reality, excessive clinging, and self-damaging behavior. Poverty, single parenthood, or maternal psychiatric symptoms did not predict these symptoms. This does not imply that child abuse is irrelevant, but that the quality of early caregiving is critically important in preventing mental health problems independent of other traumas. For that reason, treatment needs to address not only the imprints of specific traumatic events, but also the consequences of not having been mirrored, attuned to, and given consistent care and affection. Association and loss of self-regulation. Okay, I felt it was important to read that whole bit, in case anybody else deals with dissociation, wants some understanding of it. You can see how important it is in, in just the first couple of years of life, how that can then lead to you having dissociation um, and not so much abuse later in life. Okay, we have some stuff about getting all the way to the cellular level, all right? So if anybody wants to deny that this stuff is real, you can't. 
Um, okay, this is somewhat sciencey. We have RA cells. RA cells have been activated by past exposure to toxins. They quickly respond to environmental threats that have been encountered before. The RO cells, in contrast, are kept in reserve for new challenges. They are turned on to deal with threats the body has not met previously. The RA to RO ratio is the balance between cells that recognize known toxins in cells that wait for new information to activate. In patients with histories of incest, the proportion of RA cells that are ready to pounce is larger than normal. This makes the immune system oversensitive to threat so that it is prone to mount a defense when none is needed, even when this means attacking the body's own cells. Okay, the imprint of past, past trauma does not consist of only distorted perceptions of information coming from the outside. The organism itself also has a problem knowing how to feel safe. It goes all the way to a cellular level. We know this. Okay. Um, okay, this is sad. As children, we start off at the center of our own universe where we interpret everything that happens from an egocentric vantage point. If our parents or grandparents keep telling us we're the cutest, most delicious thing in the world, we don't question their judgment. We must be exactly that. And deep down, no matter what else we learn about ourselves, we will carry that sense with us that we are basically adorable. As a result, if we later hook up with somebody who treats us badly, we will be outraged. It won't feel right. It's not familiar. It's not like home. But if we are abused or ignored in childhood or grow up in a family where sexuality is treated with disgust, our inner map contains a different message. Our sense of self is marked by contempt and humiliation, and we are more likely to think he or she has my number and fail to protest if we are mistreated. That might have been one part where I cried. Because we accept, we accept what feels like home. This is kind of like that Perks of Being a Wallflower um, quote, we accept the love we think we deserve. So if we're constantly shown that we only deserve this bad kind of love and we're told that that's what love is, um, we're going to feel really weird when we experience something different from that. But when we're mistreated again by a partner, it'll feel like, oh, yep, this is what I'm used to. This is, this is correct and this is what I deserve. Okay, memory is something he gets into. Traumatic memory is very different from normal memory. Um, this person draws a picture of her childhood. It says, yet even though she'd drawn a girl who was being sexually molested, she, or at least her cognitive verbal self, had no idea what had actually happened to her. Her immune system, her muscles, and her fear system had all kept the score, but her conscious mind lacked a story that could communicate the experience. She reenacted her trauma in her life, but she had no narrative to refer to. So traumatic memory differs in complex ways from normal recall, and it involves many layers of mind and brain. <clears throat> and um, this, unfortunately, is a reason why so many people say, well, you're just making it up, or you're remembering it wrong, or somebody told you something and that implanted a false memory. Yeah, very, very upsetting. The mind simply does, it does block out certain memories. I mean, it makes so much sense. You, in order to survive, you sometimes can't remember certain things that, that would obliterate you if you did remember. The way we define their problems, our diagnosis, will determine how we approach their care. Such patients typically receive five or six different unrelated diagnoses in the course of their psychiatric treatment. If their doctors focus on their mood swings, they will be identified as bipolar and prescribed lithium or valproate. If the professionals are most impressed with their despair, they will be told they are suffering from major depression and given antidepressants. If the doctors focus on their restlessness and lack of attention, they may be categorized as ADHD and treated with Ritalin or other stimulants. And if the clinic happens to take, tra take a trauma history and the patient actually volunteers the relevant information, he or she might receive the diagnosis of PTSD. None of these diagnoses will be completely off the mark and none of them will begin to meaningfully describe who these patients are and what they suffer from. So I feel this is really important because so many people, including myself, just have diagnoses thrown at them and it 
nobody wants to talk about the root of the problem. Okay, so where did the depression and anxiety and PTSD come from? You know, why do I have trouble concentrating? Um, that I just, I don't understand why trauma isn't brought up pretty quickly in these cases. Because in a lot of these cases, that's what the root is and that is what needs to be treated. You can't just put a band-aid on the symptoms that are caused by it. When children feel pervasively angry or guilty or are chronically frightened about being abandoned, they have come by such feelings honestly. That is because of experience. When, for example, children fear abandonment, it is not in counter-reaction to their intrinsic homicidal urges. Rather, it is more likely because they have been abandoned physically or psychologically, or have been repeatedly threatened with abandonment. When children are pervasively filled with rage, it is due to rejection or harsh treatment. When children experience intense inner conflict regarding their angry feelings, this is likely because expressing them may be forbidden or even dangerous. So, it's not random. You know, people are like, oh, I, I have a great kid, or like, that person has a bad kid. It isn't random. It's coming from somewhere. Uh, so don't get me started on the DSM. This is the way that people diagnose things. The consequences of caretaker abuse and neglect are vastly more common and complex than the impact of hurricanes or motor vehicle accidents. Yet the decision makers who determined the shape of our diagnostic system decided not to recognize this evidence. To this day, after 20 years and four subsequent revisions, the DSM and the entire system based on it fail victims of child abuse and neglect, just as they ignored the plight of veterans before PTSD was introduced back in 1980. So this was published in 2014. I don't really know what has changed since then, but as of this writing, um, the DSM refused to acknowledge this other kind of PTSD, which is childhood trauma, developmental trauma disorder or something, I think it's called, <clears throat> which is just like how he says um, veterans were being ignored for their PTSD pre-1980. Just remarkable how long it takes for things to change. For people to wake up and go, oh, there actually is a serious problem here. Um, and it is a real epidemic. So there's this uh, survey he talks about, more than a quarter responded yes to the questions, did one of your parents often or very often push, grab, slap, or throw something at you? And did one of your parents often or very often hit you so hard that you had marks or were injured? In other words, more than a quarter of the U.S. population is likely to have been repeatedly physically abused as a child. More than a quarter. And that's not something that we should be concerned about. Okay, I can't remember what this stands for. There's this... This is the, the study that I just mentioned, that he's still talking about. And those with a score of 6 or above had a 15% or greater chance than those with a score of 0, currently suffering from any of the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, including chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, ischemic heart disease, I don't know how to say that, and liver disease. They were twice as likely to suffer from cancer and four times as likely to have emphysema. The ongoing stress on the body keeps taking its toll. So, your physical health is massively affected by this. So this person who presented the results of this study, he could not hold back his tears. In his career at the CDC, he had previously worked in several major risk areas, including tobacco research and cardiovascular health. But when the ACE study data started to appear on his computer screen, he realized that they had stumbled upon the gravest and most costly public health issue in the United States, child abuse. He had calculated that its overall costs exceeded those of cancer or heart disease, and that eradicating child abuse in America would re reduce the overall rate of depression by more than half, alcoholism by two-thirds, and suicide, IV drug use, and domestic violence by three-quarters. It would also have a dramatic effect on workplace performance and vastly decrease the need for incarceration. Are you angry yet? 
Okay, this is really interesting about rats. We're gonna switch gears here. One of the most cited experiments in epigenetics, epigenetics was conducted by McGill University researcher Michael Meany, who studied newborn rats, rat pups, rat pups, and their mothers. He discovered that how much a mother rat licks and grooms her pups during the first 12 hours after their birth permanently affects the brain chemicals that respond to stress and modifies the configuration of over a thousand genes. The rat pups that are intensively licked by their mothers are braver and produce lower levels of stress hormones under stress than rats whose mothers are less attentive. They also recover more quickly, an equanimity that, that lasts throughout their lives. They develop thicker connections in the hippocampus, a key center for learning and memory, and they perform better in an important rodent skill, finding their way through mazes. So I just that's that's a fascinating study because it, there's this essential time. I mean, he says in the first 12 hours after birth, it is so important that these rats be licked so much. And, and it is all observable stuff after that. They're just better set up for their rat lives. Okay, so when he talks about the first two years of a human infant's life being so critical, we can see this in other animals too. I mean, it's just undeniable. Okay, so he talks about how humans can have this short allele or a long, is it a long allele? Yeah, short and long serotonin transporter alleles. That's real fancy stuff. But basically, um, humans with the short allele had higher rates of depression than those with the long version, but this was true only if they also had a childhood history of abuse or neglect. The conclusion is clear. Children who are fortunate enough to have an attuned and attentive parent are not going to develop this genetically related problem. Boom. Nature versus nurture. Nurture is stronger than nature. Even if you have this predisposition to have low serotonin, um, you aren't going to develop the problems that are related with that if you have a good upbringing. So all this stuff about, oh, they're just naturally this way. Well, what was their infancy and childhood like? What were their care caregivers like? Having been frequently ignored or abandoned leaves them clinging and needy even with the people who have abused them. Having been chronically beaten, molested, and otherwise mistreated, they cannot help but define themselves as defective and worthless. They come by their self-loathing, sense of defectiveness, and worthlessness, honestly. Was it any surprise that they didn't trust anyone? Finally, the combination of feeling fundamentally despicable and overreacting to slight frustrations makes it difficult for them to make friends. Okay, so you're abused early in life, then you have trouble making friends, you have trouble connecting to people, you have trouble trusting people. So of course your life just from the beginning and until the end of time, unless you manage to confront and heal this, it's just going to be difficult, 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 and people will label you a difficult person um, and tell you, oh, no wonder you don't have any friends because you're so hard to be around. Well, I wonder why you're so hard to be around. And it just feels so unfair because you feel like I've been through so much and now I can't even have any sort of comfort at this stage in my life. Um, because it seems like I'm pushing people away, you know, people don't want to be around me. And it can all be traced back. Anyway. So, again, with the DSM, he's trying to get developmental trauma disorder put into the DSM. And this person, who is the executive director of the National Center for PTSD and the chair of the relevant DSM subcommittee, informed us that DTD was unlikely to be included in the DSM-5. The consensus he wrote was that no new diagnosis was required to fill a missing diagnostic niche. One million children who are abused and neglected every year in the United States, a diagnostic niche. The letter went on, the notion that early childhood adverse experiences lead to substantial developmental disruptions is more clinical intuition than a research-based fact. 
This statement is commonly made, but cannot be backed up by prospective studies. In fact, we had included several prospective studies in our proposal. So it just, I don't know, again, if this has changed in the past few years, but why are people so committed to ignoring facts? Like, what, what, why, why? Why are you looking at observable things and studies that are real and relevant and just going, mm, no, 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 don't like it. Don't like it because it's a scary truth. <sighs> okay. Nothing is written in stone, neither in the mother's personality nor the infant's neurological anomalies at birth, nor its IQ, nor its temperament, including its activity level and reactivity to stress predicted whether a child would develop serious behavioral problems in adolescence. The key issue, rather, was the nature of the parent-child relationship, how parents felt about and interacted with their kids. Okay, so as with those monkeys, the combination of vulnerable infants and inflexible caregivers made for clingy, uptight kids, insensitive, pushy, and intrusive behavior on the part of the parents at six months predicted hyperactivity and attention problems in kindergarten and beyond. Um, this person who did this study learned a great deal about resilience, the capacity to bounce back from adversity. By far the most important predictor of how well his subjects coped with life's inevitable disappointments was the level of security established with their primary caregiver during the first two years of life. And then this person also informally told the author, he thought that resilience in adulthood could be predicted by how lovable mothers rated their kids at age two. So in this study, the mothers are asked to rate how lovable is your kid. So how lovable they were rating them at age two could tell us how resilient these babies are going to be in adulthood. Age two. It's that important to get it right. And this, you know, being a parent is a big job and... I just wish people would go into it more seriously and, and really inform themselves about this stuff. That it is, it is so easy to mess somebody up forever with the stuff that you do in the first two years of their life. Okay, we're almost to the part on healing. Most of what I highlighted was about just how trauma works. The mind works according to schemes or maps and incidents that fall outside the established pattern are most likely to capture our attention. If we get a raise or a friend tells us some exciting news, we will retain the details of the moment at least for a while. We remember insults and injuries best. The adrenaline that we secrete to defend against potential threats helps to engrave those incidents into our minds. Even if the content of the remark fades, our dislike for the person who made it usually persists. So, so this is why, you know, we're always saying, why do I remember the bad things more? Or somebody might say that to you. Why do you always focus on bad memories? Well, because we literally remember them better because of the adrenaline that's secreted when they're happening. Because it's a potential threat. So we, we have that in our brain forever. And it totally makes sense why we're not just a negative person. Ah! <sighs> okay, yeah, we just need so much more education on this. While it is normal to change and distort one's memories, people with PTSD are unable to put the actual event, the source of those memories, behind them. Dissociation prevents the trauma from becoming integrated with the conglomerated, ever-shifting stores of autobiographical memory, in essence creating a dual memory system. Normal memory integrates the elements of each experience into the continuous flow of self-experience by a complex process of association. So, yeah, traumatic memory just works differently. Um... And I think that's what I'm going to say next, too. This person had a surgery where they weren't given enough anesthesia and they woke up on the table, but couldn't alert anybody that they had woken up and so experienced severe PTSD because of this. I want to tell you what a flashback is like. It is as if time is folded or warped so that the past and present merge, as if I were physically transported into the past. 
Symbols related to the original trauma, however benign in reality, are thoroughly contaminated and so become objects to be hated, feared, destroyed, if possible, avoided if not. For example, an iron in any form, a toy, a clothes iron, a curling iron, came to be seen as an instrument of torture. Each encounter with a scrub suit left me disassociated, confused, physically ill, and at times consciously angry. That whole bit is really, really interesting. This person is very articulate about um, their experience with PTSD after waking up during that surgery. Okay, next we are going to get into the healing chapters. How exciting. Okay, it is now hours later. I had to take a break for my camera to charge and for me to recharge. So let's get into the healing part of this book. Nobody can treat of war or abuse, rape, molestation, or any other horrendous event for that matter. What has happened cannot be undone, but what can be dealt with are the imprints of the trauma on body, mind, and soul, the crushing sensations in your chest that you may label as anxiety or depression, the fear of losing control, always being on alert for danger or rejection, the self-loathing, the nightmares and flashbacks, the fog that keeps you from staying on task and from engaging fully in what you are doing, being unable to fully open your heart to another human being. Trauma robs you of the feeling that you are in charge of yourself, of what I will call self-leadership. Okay, <clears throat> so he says the challenge of recovery is to re-establish ownership of your body and your mind of yourself. How can we do that? So I will say he doesn't seem to be the biggest fan of just talk therapy or just medication as ways of healing trauma. He's going to give us a lot more in-depth, some, mm, some newer methods and some that a lot of people are probably still skeptical about. And it's hard to shift a whole cultural, cultural, ooh, that word, cultural understanding of, um, how we deal with trauma when, when we live in a society where the idea of trauma itself hasn't even been taken seriously until the kind of recent, recent history. Yeah. Right, so, while human contact and attunement are the wellspring of physiological self-regulation, the promise of closeness often evokes fear of getting hurt, betrayed, and abandoned. Shame plays an important role in this. You will find out how rotten and disgusting I am and dump me as soon as you really get to know me. Unresolved trauma can take a terrible toll on relationships. If your heart is still broken because you were assaulted by someone you loved, you are likely to be preoccupied with not getting hurt again and fear opening up to someone new. In fact, you may unwittingly try to hurt them before they have a chance to hurt you. Um, where did I? Yeah, so shame. Shame plays an important role in this. We know that we need um, human contact. And yet, like he says, if we're hurt by humans, we're likely to avoid them or try and hurt them before they can hurt us because we see it as an eventuality. It's going to happen. They're going to hurt us like the last person did. Um, and I, I'm definitely somebody who says this a lot and I say it like I'm, I'm very smart and I just know this uh, for sure. That's my cat on the cat scratcher. He's a good boy. He's a good boy and I love you. Um, I say it like Oh, well, uh, if you look at my history, you know, just like statistically speaking, of course no one's ever going to treat me well, and of course no one will love me. Um, you know, just look at my abandonment history and blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, if you're feeling that way, you are not alone at all. Okay, I really liked this part about touch because touch is so important and unfortunately it's something that uh, if you have been touched in any kind of negative way it's really hard to invite back in or invite in for the first time 
the kind of physical touch from another human that is not harmful. Okay. Mainstream trauma treatment has paid scant attention to helping terrified people to safely experience their sensations and emotions. Medications such as serotonin reuptake blockers, respiridol, and seroquel have increasingly have taken the place of helping people to deal with their sensory world. However, the most natural way that we humans calm down our distress is by being touched, hugged, and rocked. This helps with excessive arousal and makes us feel intact, safe, protected, and in charge. Um, and then there's another bit here. He's talking to this bodywork practitioner. Uh, what does bodywork do for people? Leisha's reply, just like you can thirst for water, you can thirst for touch. It is a comfort to be met confidently, deeply, firmly, gently, responsibly. Mindful touch and movement grounds people and allows them to discover tensions that they may have held for so long that they are no longer even aware of them. When you are touched, you wake up to the part of your body that is being touched. The body is physically restricted when emotions are bound up inside. People's shoulders tighten, their facial muscles tense, they spend enormous energy on holding back tears or any sound or movement that might betray their inner state. When the physical tension is released, the feelings can be released. Movement helps breathing to become deeper, and as the tensions are released, expressive sounds can be discharged. The body becomes freer, breathing freer, being in flow. Touch makes it possible to live in a body that can move in response to being moved. Um, no, I'm going to read this next paragraph too. People who are terrified need to get a sense of where their bodies are in space and of their boundaries. Firm and reassuring touch lets them know where these boundaries are, what's outside them, where their bodies end. They discover that they don't constantly have to wonder who and where they are. They discover that their body is solid and that they don't have to be constantly on guard. Touch lets them know that they are safe. So, does anybody remember, um, you know, midway through 2020, quarantine time, when people were starting to talk about touch starvation, that is such a real thing. I, I remember just thinking that it has been, it's been months since I've hugged another person. And you think at first, like, oh, that's okay. But it just becomes very not okay pretty quickly. Um, so this just really resonated with me. Some, there have been times in my life where I'm so touch-starved that like someone just putting their hand on mine as a friend and, and showing a gesture of care makes me break down. So, yeah, you know, you always want to make sure you have consent for touching someone, but um, if you have that consent, like, it's so important. It's so important for us to hug each other and hold each other and it's not weird and um, I don't know, it's just, it's, it's more meaningful than most things that we can do for each other because it's, it's such a base level of human interaction. It's so intrinsic to who we are as, you know, as animals. There is no question traumatized people have irrational thoughts. I was, too I was to blame for being sexy, for being so sexy. The other guys weren't afraid they're real men. I should have known better than to walk down that street. It's best to treat those thoughts as cognitive flashbacks. You don't argue with them any more than you would argue with someone who keeps having visual flashbacks of a terrible accident. They are residues of traumatic incidents. Thoughts they were thinking when or shortly after the traumas occurred that are reactivated under stressful conditions. A better, way, a better way to treat them is with EMDR, which he gets into. Um, so yeah, I definitely am somebody who has these irrational thoughts and they, we are so capable of just being mean to ourselves, aren't we? You know, and, and pulling out only the parts of a traumatic experience that make us look like we're to blame uh, because I don't know it's drilled into us that we should not play the victim or be weak and 
you, you have to blame somebody for these awful things that have happened to you, and so it's often easiest to blame yourself. Especially because other people certainly don't want to take the blame for what they've done to you. And if it's something that keeps happening, it's very easy to just go, oh, it must be me, because I'm, I'm the consistent factor within every one of these situations, so... I'm the thing that's causing this. Now, I've definitely been told that before. Um, yeah, which is not not nice. Don't say that to people. Almost every brain imaging study of trauma patients finds abnormal activation of the insula. This part of the brain integrates and interprets the input from the internal organs, including our muscles, joints, and balance. Proprioceptive system to generate the sense of being embodied. The insula can transmit signals to the amygdala that trigger fight-flight responses. This does not require any cognitive input or any conscious recognition that something has gone awry. You just feel on edge and unable to focus, or at worst, have a sense of imminent doom. These powerful feelings are generated deep inside the brain and cannot be eliminated by reason or understanding. That, that made me feel so much better. Um, you feel on edge, unable to focus, and have a sense of imminent doom. Okay, those that's me pretty much 99% of the time, those three things. And people are always telling me different, like, ways to just chill out, man. Like, maybe you just shouldn't look at it that way. Okay, but it can't be eliminated by reason or understanding. It is not reasonable. It's coming from deep inside your brain. I mean, if that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. Ugh, when I just think about all the people that have made me feel like I'm crazy throughout my life, when it's these things that I, I didn't have and don't have any control over, um, and haven't been given the tools to learn how to heal and how to cope with properly. When people are chronically angry or scared, constant muscle tension ultimately leads to spasms, back pain, migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, and other forms of chronic pain. They may visit multiple specialists, undergo extensive diagnostic tests, and be prescribed multiple medications, some of which may provide temporary relief, but all of which fail to address the underlying issues. Their diagnosis will come to define their reality without ever being identified as a symptom of their attempt to cope with trauma. Yep. I'll just be repeating myself at this point, but... My back pain. I mean, I've done acupuncture, which was like mentally very good. Massage therapy, uh, physical therapy, chiropractic care, everything. Okay. Okay, alexithemia is the technical term for not being able to identify what's going in on inside oneself. People who suffer from this tend to feel physically uncomfortable but cannot describe exactly what the problem is. As a result, they often have multiple vague and distressing physical complaints that doctors can't diagnose. In addition, they can't figure out for themselves what they're really feeling about any given situation or what makes them feel better or worse. This is the result of numbing, which keeps them from anticipating and responding to the ordinary demands of their bodies in quiet, mindful ways. At the same time, it muffles the everyday sensory delights of experiences like music, touch, and light, which imbue life with value. Um, yoga turned out to be a terrific way to regain a relationship with the interior world, and with it, a caring, loving, sensual relationship to the self. So this is all in the chapter about yoga. I guess I can tell you, tell you the names of the chapters that he talks about in the Paths to Recovery section. Well, we have EMDR, which is fascinating, and I won't go into much, but it's, what is it called? I Something eye movement desensitization, I can't remember. Let me see, it's at the beginning here. Eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. It's like where you follow the person's finger, like so you have rapid eye movement, sort of the way that you do when you're in REM sleep. And it creates a this pathway for your brain to to be both talking or thinking about your trauma 
while re looking at it in a different way um, because you're able to be, I don't know, it's like you're present, but you're also in the past, but you know you're present, so you can kind of rewire things. All of the examples of EMDR in this book sound like a freaking miracle, and it's absolutely something that I've got to try. If you've done it, let me know what your experience was like. So we have EMDR, we also have language, he talks about writing letters to yourself, yoga, um, self-leadership, creating structures is very interesting, and applied neuroscience, rewiring the fear-driven mind with brain-computer interface technology, and then finding your voice, communal rhythms, and theater. Coping takes its toll. For many children, it is safer to hate themselves than to risk their relationship with their caregivers by expressing anger or by running away. As a result, abused children are likely to grow up believing that they are fundamentally unlovable. That was the only way their young minds could explain why they were treated so badly. They survive by denying, ignoring, and splitting off large chunks of reality. They forget the abuse. They suppress their rage or despair. They numb their physical sensations. If you were abused as a child, you are likely to have a childlike part living inside you that is frozen in time, still holding fast to this kind of self-loathing self and denial. Many adults who survive terrible experiences are caught in the same trap. Pushing away intense feelings can be highly adaptive in the short run. It may help you preserve your dignity, dignity and independence. It may help you maintain focus on critical tasks like saving a comrade, taking care of your kids, or rebuilding your house. The problems come later. So yeah, I just highlighted that because I'm thinking about the being frozen in time. Of course it's difficult for us to, to experience growth and self-love, any kind of change in the present, in our adult selves, when, when there is this part of us that is actually frozen as that child who was abused or neglected. Interesting. Interesting. Just a reminder to not be hard on yourself through this process. Okay, there's this thing called IFS, Internal Family Systems. Where's my note? Okay. And he talks about the different, like, people that are part of this system. So within yourself, you have all these different things. Um, he says, we all have parts. Right now, a part of me feels like taking a nap. Another part wants to keep writing. Still feeling injured by an offensive email message. A part of me wants to hit reply on a stinging put down. While a different part wants to shrug it off. So... There's like a good description of this. The family metaphor... It offers a systematic way to work with the split-off parts that result from trauma. At the core of IFS is the notion that the mind of each of us is like a family in which the members have different levels of maturity, excitability, wisdom, and pain. The parts form a network or system in which change in any one part will affect all the others. The IFS model helped me realize that association occurs on a continuum. In trauma, the self-system breaks down and parts of the self become polarized and go to war with one another. Self-loathing coexists and fights with grandiosity, loving care with hatred, numbing and passivity with rage and aggression. These extreme parts bear the burden of trauma. Um, in IFS, a part is considered not just a passing emotional state or customary thought pattern, but a distinct mental system with its own history, abilities, needs, and worldview. Trauma injects parts with beliefs and emotions that hijack them out of their naturally valuable state. For example, we all have parts that are childlike and fun. When we are abused, these are the parts that are hurt the most, and they become frozen, carrying the pain, terror, and betrayal of abuse. This burden makes them toxic, parts of ourselves that we need to deny at all costs. Because they are locked away inside, IFS calls them the exiles. At this point, other parts organize to protect the internal family from the exiles. These protectors keep the toxic parts away, but in doing so, they take on some of the energy of the abuser. Critical and perfectionistic managers can make sure we never get close to anyone or drive us to be relentlessly productive. Another group of protectors which IFS calls firefighters 
are emergency responders acting impulsively whenever an experience triggers an exiled emotion. So anytime we have a bad, you know, bad emotion, these firefighters, they will try to put out the fire at the expense of the house itself. Like they, they'll just go absolutely nuts um, trying to push this bad thing away, you know, get rid of these exiles. Um, I just thought this was a very interesting approach, and he gives some examples of patients. There's examples of patients throughout this whole book, just so you know. Um, it's some very difficult situations that you will read about, which is why the content warning. But it's really, really super helpful to see these people, real people, actually confronting their trauma and using these uh, methods to heal it. Where am I? Two seventy-five, two eighty-one, two eighty-one. Okay. Keeping the exiles locked up, however, stamps out not only memories and emotions, but also the parts that hold them, the parts that were hurt the most by the trauma. Usually those are your most sensitive, creative, intimacy-loving, lively, playful, and innocent parts. By exiling them when they get hurt, they suffer a double whammy. The insult of your rejection is added to their original injury. Um, so as this patient discovered, keeping the exiles hidden and despised was condemning her to a life without intimacy or genuine joy. Makes sense. Uh, you know, we all, we all talk about like our inner critic. Well, this just really expounds on that. Because it's just, it's like these different parts of ourselves that are actually fighting each other and making things worse for ourselves. Now there's this chapter on creating structures. Uh, it is one thing to process memories of trauma, but it is an entirely different matter to confront the inner void, the holes in the soul that result from not having been wanted, not having been seen, and not having been allowed to speak the truth. If your parents' faces never lit up when they looked at you, it's hard to know what it feels like to be loved and cherished. If you come from an incomprehensible world filled with secrecy and fear, it's almost impossible to find the words to express what you have endured. If you grew up unwanted and ignored, it is a major challenge to develop a visceral sense of agency and self-worth. Um, so in this chapter, he talks about this very interesting thing where you, you project your internal landscape outward. So first he talks about with, with actual objects, you know, you're sitting in a room, now choose an object to represent your mother and your father and wh whoever else is important in your life. And when he does this himself, he chooses this big leather couch and scary lamp to be his parents and then little soft pillows to be his wife and children and a tissue box to be his best friend, you know, like small comforting things. And then the, um, the person leading this says, okay, now sit back and look at, look at what you've done. And he's also arranged the room, like, where does he want these things? And he goes, oh my God, I've chosen these really like upsetting, hulking figures to be my parents. And then these comforting little things for the people that I feel more comfortable with. And then the person stands between this author and the couch and lamp, and he feels an immediate sense of relief. So, um, he says after that experience he decided to be that person's student and then we get to look at some examples where they did this with you know in a group setting and in the group you have one person be the protagonist and they get to sort of rewrite the script so you will you get to choose somebody to represent um, let's say your father and then maybe you choose another person to represent your ideal father or you have that person change into the ideal father and they aren't allowed to improv but they have an exact script where they say I am taking on the role of your father who neglected you or shouted at you or whatever um, and then you'll have the ideal father say you know if I had been there as your ideal father I would have loved you and done this and that and the other and um, things would have been better 
and it's just it creates such a visceral reaction in people when they get to see this laid out in front of them and they'll arrange the people in the room where they want them you know they might have like their ideal mother sit right next to them and um and in one case the ideal parents like held the person and it was just like i'm gonna cry thinking about it just that they were able to go my life would have been so much different if this if this was how it was um and it just seems like such a healing experience i think this is one of the most important points in this book so when he talks about these these structures that they're creating structures promote one of the essential conditions for deep therapeutic change a trance-like state in which multiple realities can live side by side past and present knowing that you're an adult while feeling the way you did as a child expressing your rage or terror to someone who feels like your abuser while being fully aware that you are talking to Scott, who is nothing like your real father, and experiencing simultaneously the complex emotions of loyalty, tenderness, rage, and longing that kids feel with their parents. Um, so this is this is part of the experience of creating structures where you have somebody representing someone who abused you or hurt you, and you can shout at them and say everything you wish you could have said to them back then, and you know make things the way that you wish they could be or or just get off your chest these things that need to be said and like i was trying to explain with emdr this is what i meant where multiple realities can live side by side you know you're an adult but you're accessing these feelings that you had as a child these feelings that are still there deep down um so you're like being able to live in those two places at once I think that is what helps you change things. I don't know. Change the way that your your brain is sort of stuck, because it's always been stuck seeing it a certain way, and now you're seeing, like, a way that it could have gone, which, I don't know, that just really interests me. When we cannot rely on our body to signal safety or warning and instead feel chronically overwhelmed by physical stirrings, we lose the capacity to feel at home in our own skin and by extension in the world. As long as their map of the world is based on trauma, abuse, and neglect, people are likely to seek shortcuts to oblivion. Anticipating rejection, ridicule, and deprivation, they are reluctant to try out new options, certain that these will lead to failure. This lack of experimentation traps people in a matrix of fear, isolation, and scarcity, where it is impossible to welcome the very experiences that might change their basic worldview. So we stick to what we know, uh, even, if, even if it's horrible. You know how when you or someone you know gets really depressed and people are like, oh, you, you need to go for a walk, you need to exercise, or whatever would normally help you in this situation, and you are just like, nope, it's not going to help. How, how could I feel any different than I do right now? There's a great line in um, Normal People, and I did a video on that, where the character is so depressed, and they're lying on the ground just like breathing the horrendous carpet and thinking like, if I stood up, it would be no different than this right now, so why don't I just keep doing what I'm doing right now? And um, this extends to, you know, seeking help as well. I know, I know from experience, you, you just get so stuck thinking, Obviously, nothing's going to change this, so why should I try this, that, and the other? You know, last year I finally got to the point where I was doing so bad, I was like, you know what, I need to try medication again, because I hadn't tried it since I was 16, and went on something for depression, and then realized it was not for me because of the side effects and the weird numbness that I felt. But now I'm feeling like, after reading this book, there are so many more options than just medication not to say that you should not try it you should absolutely do um, everything that you can to take care of yourself but it's just very interesting to know that there are so many other things out there but yeah i've been through i've been in a lot of depressive states where i wouldn't even think to reach out or i would think like what is the point because i'm i'm trash i'm garbage nobody's gonna want to help me and i don't want to be helped because i don't deserve it
Okay, there's important new information about how traumatized people process non-traumatic information that has profound implications for understanding day-to-day -day information processing. These brainwave patterns could explain why so many traumatized people have trouble learning from experience and fully engaging in their daily lives. Their brains are not organized to pay careful attention to what is going on in the present moment. So this is where we get um, in the applied neuroscience chapter. This is probably the most like sciency of all of these things. And you look at these actual brain waves and you've got normal versus PTSD. So this is patterns of attention. Milliseconds after the brain is presented with input, it starts organizing the meaning of the incoming information. Normally all the regions of the brain collaborate in a synchronized pattern, like in that one. While the brain waves in PTSD are less well coordinated, the brain has trouble filtering out irrelevant information and has problems attending to the stimulus at hand. Completely understand that. Um, it all makes so much sense. In some ways, neurofeedback is similar to watching someone's face during a conversation. Hopefully this helps you understand neurofeedback. It's a little confusing. If you see smiles or slight nods, you're rewarded, and you go on telling your story or making your point. But the moment your conversation partner looks bored or shifts her gaze, you'll start to wrap up or change the topic. In neurofeedback, the reward is a tone or movement on the screen instead of a smile, and the inhibition is far more neutral than a frown. It's simply an undesired pattern. So they like put these, what I gather is they put these like little electrodes on your head and then show you things. And it's just, it's this way of training your brain to be more focused. And they've used it apparently on Olympians who ended up like winning way more gold medals because they were so focused. Uh, this also just sounds like a miracle if it could work. And it seems like it really does work for a lot of people. Our patients find it very helpful to be able to see the patterns of localized electrical activity in their brains. We can show them the patterns that seem to be responsible for their difficulty focusing or for their lack of emotional control. They can see why different brain areas need to be trained to generate different frequencies and communication patterns. These explanations help them shift from self-blaming attempts to control their behavior to learning to process information differently. So you're just, you're teaching your brain. Um, it's been wired a certain way because of PTSD and then you can train it to rewire itself. I know I'm always using the term wire. Uh, I don't think that's a, a technical term, but it's something we kind of all understand. Okay, so this is in the communal rhythms and theater chapter. He's talking about his own son and he gets cast in this play and his son's been doing really bad because he has all these health problems and it has to miss um, a ton of school. And so he has this identity as self-hating and, and isolated. And then he's in this play and he's playing the Fonz in Happy Days being adored by girls and keeping an audience spellbound became the real tipping point in his recovery. Unlike his experience with the numerous therapists who had talked with him about how bad he felt, theater gave him a chance to deeply and physically experience what it was like to be someone other than the learning disabled oversensitive boy that he had gradually become. Being a valued contributor to a group gave him a visceral experience of power and confidence. I believe that this new embodied version of himself set him on the road to becoming the creative loving adult he is today. Uh, so I can vouch for the impact of theater and performing in general. I, For somebody who is so shy and has stage fright and is just generally very nervous, almost everything I've done in life has been performance-based. It's very weird. But I keep my, finding myself in these places where I'm either on a stage or improving or just, you know, performing other people's words or performing my own words um, or performing physically with no words. I just have done a lot of performance and it does, it does really help you connect with like the best parts of yourself. 
um, you know, and it gives you a sense of, of pride and satisfaction in what you've managed to accomplish. Yeah, creativity is just very important in general. Um, okay. Traumatized people are afraid of conflict. They fear losing control and ending up on the losing side once again. Conflict is central to theater. Inner conflicts, interpersonal conflicts, family conflicts, social conflicts, and their consequences. Trauma is about trying to forget, hiding how scared, enraged, or helpless you are. Theater is about finding ways of telling the truth and convey conveying deep truths to your audience. This requires pushing through blockages to discover your own truth exploring and examining your own internal experience so that it can emerge in your voice and body on stage. So that just made a lot of sense to me. Um, because, yeah, I, I definitely fear conflict. 100%. Do not. Mm -mm, can't do it. So, like, throwing yourself into a situation where, where conflict is safe because it's a controlled environment and this is all in the script and everybody wants you to succeed because you're all in the play together so, you, you know, you need it to succeed. You need everybody to work together for it to succeed. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's obvious how that can be very helpful. And then this part, too, really hits the nail on the head. The focus changes naturally as rehearsals begin. The foster kid's history of pain, alienation, and fear is no longer central, and the emphasis shifts to how can I become the best actor, singer, dancer, choreography, or lighting and set designer I can possibly be. Being able to perform becomes the critical issue. Competence is the best defense against the helplessness of trauma. This is, of course, true for all of us. When the job goes bad, when a cherished project fails, when someone you count on leaves you or dies, there are few things as helpful as moving your muscles and doing something that demands focused attention. Inner city schools and psychiatric programs often lose sight of this. They want the kids to behave normally without building the competencies that will make them feel normal. So, yeah, when, when everything in your life feels out of control, this having this purpose and feeling like you're part of a team or you're just you're part of making something succeed and you have a, there's a usefulness to it and you have value within this community um that is so important just yeah having a purpose in general and also like giving you something else to focus on um like if you've been if you've been so focused on a particular horrible event in your life and then you're in a play and you have to really, really focus on learning your lines, you know, that becomes the issue for you. And that's a much better issue to have than, you know, something horrendous at home. Okay, this is in the epilogue and this is, I, it's just so upsetting that we, as, as a society, do not prioritize the things that we should be prioritizing. Okay, after attending another wake for a teenager who was killed in a drive-by shooting in the Blue Hill Avenue section of Boston, or after reading about the latest school budget cuts in impoverished cities and towns, I find myself close to despair. In many ways, we seem to be regressing, with measures like the callous congressional elimination of food stamps for kids whose parents are unemployed or in jail, with the stubborn opposition to universal health care in some quarters, with psychiatry's obtuse refusal to make connection between psychic suffering and social conditions, with the refusal to prohibit the sale or possession of weapons whose only purpose is to kill large numbers of human beings, and with our tolerance for incarcerating a huge segment of our population, wasting their lives as well as our resources. People can learn to control and change their behavior, but only if they feel safe enough to experiment with new solutions. The body keeps the score. If trauma is encoded in heartbreaking and gut-wrenching sensations, then our first priority is to help people move out of fight-or-flight states, reorganize their perception of danger, and manage relationships. Where traumatized children are concerned, the last things we should be cutting from school schedules are the activities that can do precisely that. Chorus, physical education, recess, and anything else that involves movement, play, and other forms of joyful engagement. Don't get me started on, I don't know what they're calling it now, but when I was a kid, the FCAT, Florida whatever test, we had to, basically like your whole school life became around passing this test specifically. You just learned things that revolved around this test. 
Okay, so anything else was sort of secondary, um, not important, because this was the way that the schools made their money, I guess. If we got good grades, you got more money. It is so disgusting. Yeah, I'm not even gonna... I can't. I can't. Our increasing use of drugs to treat these conditions doesn't address the real issues. What are these patients trying to cope with? What are their internal or external resources? How do, we, how do they calm themselves down? Do they have caring relationships with their bodies? And what do they do to cultivate a physical sense of power, vitality, and relaxation? Do they have dynamic interactions with other people? Who really knows them, loves them, and cares about them? Whom can they count on when they're scared, when their babies are ill, or when they are sick themselves? Are they members of a community, and do they play vital roles in the lives of the people around them? What specific skills do they need to focus, pay attention, and make choices? Do they have a sense of purpose? What are they good at? How can we help them feel in charge of their lives? Don't all these things sound so much more wildly important than um, do they know the quadratic equation? What's more important in building a society and a world full of people that function well and care for themselves and care for each other because they've been given the tools to do that, what's more important? Okay, last thing. Self-regulation can be taught to many kids who cycle between frantic activity and immobility. In addition to reading, writing, and arithmetic, all kids need to learn self-awareness, self-regulation, and communication as part of their core curriculum. Just as we teach history and geography, we need to teach children how their brains and bodies work. For adults and children alike, being in control of ourselves requires becoming familiar with our inner world and accurately identifying what scares, upsets, or delights us. Okay, and that's not going to happen as long as we are not focusing on the actual issues at hand and while we are just sweeping things under the rug. So I noticed as a substitute that we do we do talk about emotions in schools, you know, when when kids are very little, not so much beyond kindergarten. Um but even then I never felt like I was at a school where they where they had it really dialed in, like really figured out how to deal with what they call behavioral issues. I never saw a good, um, a good outcome, a good way that things were handled, and it just made me so incredibly sad. I couldn't do it anymore. And so I, I have a lot of respect for people who continue in those jobs, and I'm just very fearful that right now our teachers, who should be so very valued, are not valued and are, um watching their jobs become harder and harder and harder. And I understand why so many of them are quitting. And I'm just very worried. I'm very worried about the state of education and the future of it. Uh, but I, I have to have hope or I'll lose it. So um, I have hope that, that one day, maybe when I'm long gone, that we will do the things that he says in here, that we will focus more on, on teaching humans how to know themselves and regulate themselves and, yeah, to be familiar with, with your own brain, mind, body, everything, and how it all works as a whole. Okay, that was so much. That was so much. Look at this. Look at this whiteboard. Is anybody still watching at this point? I, or is, sometimes I feel like that at the end of my videos. I'm like, at this point I'm talking to myself. But no, um, some, some of you guys do watch all the way. But yeah, I have all these notes and I still feel like I just barely scratched the surface of how great this book is and how much it means to me. I've already recommended it to everybody in the world and um, multiple people have told me that they've bought it or reading it or listening to it or it's next on their list so that oh like how could anything make me more happy than like somebody listening to my book recommendations like that is just the most exciting thing so please please read read this um 
If you like it, recommend it. Share it with people who you think need to read it. I think everybody needs to read it. I know it is difficult um, subject matter for, for some people, but if, if everybody had this kind of knowledge and we, we were more educated about these things, this would not continue to be an issue. And I mean, can you imagine eliminating childhood trauma, like eliminating child abuse? Um, and that's not even getting into other kinds of trauma. But it's just, I don't know. I gotta feel hopeful that the epidemic that is child abuse can be can be fixed. I mean, it can if we if we just have the knowledge and uh, make the right choices and do the right things and raise our kids in a loving environment. This doesn't have to keep happening. Um, but yeah, that's not the only kind of trauma that he touches on in this book. Unfortunately, a lot of things in life, a lot of events, a lot of things can be traumatizing to us. And I just hope that if you are in that boat and feeling like any of that resonated with you, like you can really see yourself in some of these descriptions, that you not only read this, but really try some of the methods. And probably the easiest things in here would be um, yoga and theater, like you can you can get into a yoga class pretty easily. Do that because I I go to yoga once a week, and it's one of the only times in the week where I feel relaxed and like in tune with my body. That's so important. Um, so do try that. And then if you feel like you want to venture out into EMDR or neurofeedback, any of this kind of interesting stuff, I would love to hear your experience, and I am hoping to do that myself. So thank you for going on this journey with me. This might be the longest video I've ever done, but it's so necessary. And, um, yeah. Wow, that was a lot of words. I feel like I need to read something pretty easy next. But instead of doing that, I went straight into reading a book in French, which I am apparently not fluent in. So I'm just really testing myself this year. Anyway, thank you for watching, and I will see you all next time. Until then, happy reading, and please, please take care of yourself and others.